gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again, so very grateful, so very thankful for, for just who you are and all that you're doing in our lives. I thank you, dear Father, for the gift of your Son, that we may have life, that, that we may have your word to study upon it, to feast on it. I just ask that you would take in this time and just take control of this time, filter out all of the foolishness, all of the error, just seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're back studying uh, through the epistle to the Philippians, verse by verse. Uh, in our last study, we just finished the ninth verse of the fourth chapter. And one of the urgings that we saw in the third chapter is that we might know the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Uh, and I suggested that the power of his resurrection is that we've been made as righteous as Christ, that he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I believe it goes beyond that and speaks... It regard, it's really addressing, uh, or at least it's including, our identification with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Or that we're not the focus, but Christ is. We know he was delivered because of our offenses. Uh, he was raised because we were made righteous. And had he not risen from the dead, then the testimony would have been, would have been that, that what he did was not enough. It wasn't sufficient. But the fact that he did rise from the dead is the testimony of the sufficiency of his finished work. Folks, his work is finished. We can't add anything to what he did. And so we are thereby made righteous. Mm -hmm. That's a hard kind of a thing to grasp onto uh, particularly when uh, we live in a, in a body and in in a world uh, which values uh, someone putting their best foot forward the righteousness is not achieved on the human level there's none righteous except God all all righteousness is of the of the Lord and yet we were made the righteousness and I'm talking about the very righteousness of God in Christ were made as righteous as God's son. That ought to be a life changer for every single Christian alive. And why it isn't is kind of confuses me, I guess. It's, it's not that they can't know this because this is what we were told. When we got to verse 8, it was, you know, uh, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and you going down the list there and, and I suggested these were characteristics of our Lord himself his life it was a beautiful a lovely portrait of of the living Word of God now uh, as I've gone on and, and studied uh, through this a little more I'll make another suggestion it may be the very Word of God itself that is also a possibility I suppose you could also say that it's it's the characteristics of the new sinless new man. Uh, that, that would probably be the, the least of, or the, it'd be on last on my list of, of things, of, of possibilities. Uh, I tend to lean heavily toward it being the, uh, just describing our Lord. These things truly do describe our Lord. But at the same time, I also have to admit that they could very well uh, you could even say that these describe God's word. God could be showing us that these things are God's word. Now, what they can't be, what they cannot be, is whatever we want to make them out to be. You know, where we go down the list and, and we look at what's true, what's true for you, it may not be true for someone else. You know, whatever thing is, whatever things are honest to, to you, may not be honest to somebody else. You know, it's like like we have our. You know, each of us have our individual, our own unique set of morals, standards. And so I, it just doesn't work that way. 
So we're going to begin with verse 9. I'm going to, I hope that, and I want to take a moment to just thank you all for continuing along with us in these studies. We're about to, to reach the end of Philippians here in a few weeks, and and uh, and I believe it's been decided that we're going to move on to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Looking at verse 9, those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now, if you go over to 1 Timothy, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, uh, it's, it's interesting where we read, For this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus, uh, that in me first, uh, says Paul, in me first Christ might show forth all long suffering, uh, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. A pattern in the word there, basically in the original text, means prototype. Paul is a prototype. He's an example. Okay? The way that God dealt in the life of Paul, he's dealing the, the exactly the same in yours and mine. Paul was a prototype. He was the example of all those who would hereafter believe. Which brings us to the 10th verse. Verse 10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. And uh, most preachers I know are very uncomfortable in dealing with passages for some odd reason. They seem very uncomfortable uh, dealing with passages that have to do with giving, uh, with offerings, uh, with uh, a verse like what we just read. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, says Paul, that now at the last, finally, at the last, your care, your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Now, if you read many of the commentators on this verse, what, what the idea that you'll kind of get is, is that this is sort of a, a soft uh, rebuke. It's a gentle rebuke to the believers at Philippi. Uh, kind of like, you know, well, you should have been giving all along, but you, but you didn't do it. Okay. And I think a careful analysis of the text says that that is not true. I think the text is clearly saying that God, the Holy Spirit, is commending the believers at Philippi. I rejoice greatly that now you had a chance again in your care for me, seeing that you have always had that concern. It's, it's an imperfect in the Greek, imperfect tense. It had always been the attitude of the believers at Philippi to be concerned about the work of the Holy Spirit in the, in the Apostle Paul. But they hadn't had the opportunity. The text clearly indicates that it has always been their attitude. The grammar confirms that it's it's always been their attitude. They just didn't have it to give. And, and, and our thoughts immediately, right away, it goes, we think of money or possessions. It's just, I don't know, human nature, I suppose. And I remind you of the importance of context. You know, I, I think that's only a tiny aspect of what we're looking at in the closing paragraphs of this letter. There are so many other things, folks, that are vastly superior to just money. And the verse says that it has been their habitual attitude to have that concern. But they haven't been able to put it into practice because of the difficulties in their own lives. And, of course, you know, given the fact that I wasn't back there at that time, that I don't have a real clear insight into just exactly what was going on uh, in the church at Philippi, uh, I guess I suppose we can only speculate on that just why that that was the case but the text makes it clear that that's that was the case 
perhaps they couldn't help Paul because of at, at this at one particular time they, they they wanted to, but they couldn't help him because of the difficulties in their own lives, because of the persecution that was taking place, uh, because of the separation, uh, because of the distance. For whatever reason, the Holy Spirit really doesn't list those reasons, and I think that's probably a good idea that he didn't, because if he had, we'd have jumped all over those reasons and and use them in the wrong way but uh, he didn't list he didn't list the reasons and it's probably for our good that he didn't so there was a problem at Philippi which indicates that they had a, a longing to do something that they couldn't do and I see God I see God aware of the fact that one has a longing to do something that he can't do I see a brother physically weak, and in a minute, without a second thought, I'd give that brother, you know, any strength that I had. You know, Sue is sick, and, and if I guess if I could, I'd, you know, I would give her whatever strength that I had. I mean, many of us would do that. It's not uncommon. You know, it wouldn't be uncommon for many of us to do, to, to want to do that, if we could. If we could, if we could help but we can't, okay? Uh, and thousands of times in my experience as a Bible teacher being used of the Lord, I, I would have done anything in my power to solve someone else's problem. But I didn't have the means, the ability, the power, the resources. I didn't have what it took to do that. And, and sometimes, folks, the easiest thing for us to do is to give money. But I am persuaded that the verse is not limited to just money. I mean, is there anything too hard for God? I mean, the, the answer obviously has to be no. It's, and so I have to believe that it was for the good of the Philippians and it was for the good of Paul that they had not been able to fellowship with this need. But there is nothing in the verse that condemns the, the Philippians. There's nothing in the verse that says God remembers that they were concerned that they would have done anything if they could have done it. Or, or, or there's everything. There's everything in the verse to suggest that they, they would have done whatever they could if, if they had had means to do it. They just didn't have the provision at the time to do it. You know, it's easy to help somebody move furniture, you know, if you've got a pickup truck, you know, uh, or, or give a little bit of money to pay a bill. It's harder to fellowship in the suffering, to spend time in prayer, to uh, in fellowship, in communion, in friendship. Don't just read this as you know, money, gifts, uh, helps in that sense. I, the, the, the context, folks, I believe, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm not asking anyone to agree with me here, but I'm just, I just, I cannot limit this to just financial, uh, some financial aspect of their relationship. Sometimes giving money, you know, that's great. But what if the person that you were giving that money to, what if they needed something more than that? What if they needed, what if what they really needed was something that money couldn't buy? I believe that it's, it's I, I feel safe. I feel uh, safe suggesting that, that given the context that we're looking at that this can this could include much more than just dollars or cents so the Holy Spirit is commending the believers at, at Philippi for their attitude of mind it's not that the Holy Spirit. I don't do not see the Holy Spirit blaming the Philippians or rebuking even a soft, a, a mild rebuke. There, 
I don't see any rebuke at all. I see the Holy Spirit commending the Philippians for having the mind, having the attitude, the willingness to do what they they really couldn't do, but 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 their heart was in the right place. That's what I see. That's what I see in the text. So that's what God looked at. And I want you to take now and look at the fact and consider very, very seriously the fact that Paul didn't need anything. Didn't need anything. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want. Now, folks, don't just read that without giving it some thought. That verse is fraught with meaning. The Holy Spirit puts that in there so that you will clearly understand that Paul is clearly indicating to these believers that he had no need. Okay? He says... I'm not destitute. I'm not speaking in respect to anything that, that is in contrast to abundance. I don't, I don't have any need. That's not why I'm talking about this. Okay? And yet the Christian community is tremendously interested in, these, in those physical gifts. Folks, I don't know whether this fellowship here will... Blessed Hope Forever, this YouTube channel, uh, the website. Uh, I don't know whether it will continue or not. I trust that we can leave that with the Lord. If the Lord doesn't want this work to continue here, he'll place us some, someplace else. I don't think our primary concern is the continuance of this ministry is what I'm saying. Our primary concern, folks, is a diligent study of the person and the work of our Lord. I don't, I don't see one verse of Scripture where God says, you know, well, isn't it really too bad that that the that that wealthy church at, at Thessalonica ceased to exist? I don't, I don't see that. And and the believers in, in difficulty at Philippi as you know, folks, are no longer there at all. And bear in mind that Paul is in prison. He's chained to a Roman guard. What do you mean Paul doesn't have any need? The text says he has no need. Paul says, I, I don't have any need. And yet here he is chained to a Roman guard in a, Rome, in a Roman prison, Paul says, I'm not talking at all about the fact that I have anything less than abundance. That is not why I bring that up. I'm praising God that you have always had an attitude of concern, even though you lack the means, even though you lack the opportunity. The cause of my joy is not that you gave to my needs. That's not it. Absolutely not that. In fact, I don't have any need. I don't have anything less than abundance. For I've learned in whatever state I have been put. Please, folks, please. I mentioned how we needed to slow down and look at the text and read it. Uh, and honestly, deal honestly with the text. In whatever state I have been put, placed, is what Paul said. And there's a wealth of meaning in that expression. The text says that I have learned with the result that I know that in whatever state I've been placed. Okay? That's, that's what it says. Can't change the grammar. Paul's, Paul's basically saying that look, there, look, there's, there is no, there's been no departure from the truth that all things work together for the good, that God holds us in the hollow of his hand, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he directs our steps. You know, that he always causes us to triumph, that he always gives us the victory, that after we've suffered a while, he'll establish, settle, strengthen us. Those truths have not changed. 
God hasn't changed. I have learned in whatsoever state, says Paul, I, that I have been placed to be content. I've learned in whatsoever state that I've been placed not to look at present circumstances. That's what the verse says. Not to have my eyes on those present earthly circumstances. You know, it, it, it's not some some kind of fatalistic, you know, verse that, that says, you know, oh, well, this is the way it is. That's the way it is, you know. But the text is one that lifts, lifts our eyes off of our present circumstances. You cannot, folks, you can't tell me that you're settled on, your mind is settled on things above when you think, well, you know, if, man, if I just hadn't done this or that, then this wouldn't have happened and, and so on and so forth. I have learned, Paul says, and that word is an aorist. It's not something we ought to learn over and over again. It's aorist, an aorist tense. Paul learned it. Okay? Done. It's done. Okay? Uh, how did he learn it? That's, this, is, this is where it gets interesting. This is where it's important to look at the words, the word meanings. Okay? Folks, you have to look at word meanings. And it really helps to look at the grammar. How did he learn it? I took it from the Word of God. I know it intellectually, he says. Not, not experientially, but intellectually. This is one of the reasons that causes me to maybe lean more toward all of the things in verse 8, all those lovely things as being characteristics of the Word of God or a description of the Word of God rather than uh, as much, the, you know, the characteristics of the life of our Lord. And, and of course, when I talk about, you know, that, then I have to remind myself that Christ is the Word. And so, you know, you've got the written Word, the living Word, and, you know, maybe you get the point. So it could be that the things that we saw, that we really we read, that we would think on are the Word of God. And I'm told Jesus is the Word. You may think Paul is saying, boy, I learned it the hard way. Now you go out, y'all, you Philippians, you go out and you learn it, you know, the heart, just like the way I did. But the word he uses is oida. Okay, it'd be wrong, in my opinion, to say, uh, you know, I... I can't know that God will never leave me nor forsake me until I'm in I'm until he does or until or until I'm in a desperately dangerous situation or or I can't know the truth that God will supply all my needs until I have needs that need to be supplied until I have needs that, that need to be supplied I can't know okay that God will supply all my needs that no one would say that this this is why I'm trying to explain to you that it's the word is oida perfect knowledge Paul knows. He didn't learn through experience. He learned it because God said it. Okay? Uh, you know, you wouldn't say, well, I have the victory. You know, as long as I have a lot of money, I have the victory. You know, if I have the victory, uh, it, if I'm poor, I have the victory. It, folks if i'm sick i have the victory okay because i why because i know it i know it perfectly from god's word because why because he said it i believe we're looking at an attitude of setting our attention on things above so that we're not walking by sight that's what he's saying in verse 11 i'm not looking at my present earthly circumstances I'm not governed by the circumstances that that surround my life. Well, I think one could could literally translate the Greek. You know, I have learned in whatsoever state I've been placed to be content. I, I see in the perfect tense the fact that when God tells me something, that's it. I now know it. Why do I know it? And why do I know it perfectly? Because God said it.
uh, I've spoken on this in the past. Uh, I've on how uh, you know we don't. I don't need a piece of rotten wood to convince me that there really was an ark. Okay. Do I know that there's an ark because somebody found a piece of rotten wood? No, well, no, absolutely not. I know there was an ark because God said there was an ark. And I see the text saying, I know it perfectly because God said it, says Paul. You know, it, it really does. It blesses my heart that the word is not gnosko, experiential knowledge, okay? Like as if I, I, I couldn't know these things unless I've been through all the experiences that Paul went through. Or, uh, you know, I know full well God says Paul went through, you know, shipwreck, beatings, jails, imprisonments, starving, dangers, stone, uh, you know, left for dead, you, no telling what else. Why isn't this Gnosko? Because I think the Holy Spirit is saying Paul didn't learn it by his experiences. He learned it by the truth of God's word. That's why he knows it. Now, moving on to verse 12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. He says, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I am made to know how to be both abased. Okay? The grammar really comes in important here, folks. I am made to know how to be both abased or, or to be or to be deficient really is the word. And that is a present passive, a passive voice. Paul says he is made to be deficient. And Paul was, okay? He, he was. He was made. He was made to be the offscouring of the ecclesiastical system. You know, he's he's looked at Paul. He's looked at as the garbage of an ecclesiastical system, which, interestingly, uh, a system which he interestingly considered to be garbage to know Christ. That's that's interesting. Uh, To know Christ experientially. And Christians, folks, in the main today, they don't want that. Even, even though the ecclesiastical system today is embracing things which are contrary to Scripture, I know perfect knowledge, how to be made humble, constantly. And I know, I know, okay, perfect tense, oida, that's a present active. It's, it's really interesting that the, the first one here is a, uh, is a passive voice, and the second one is an active voice. That's telling us that, that God's characteristic action in our life is not to have us abound, but to be humbled. And the abounding is an active voice. They're, they're both present tenses. That would seem to indicate that, that they're both concurrent. You know, he's, he's, what Paul is saying is he's saying at the, the same time I'm being humbled by God, I'm abounding. That's what he's saying. <laughs> at the same time that I'm being humbled by God, I'm abounding. You know, it'd be easy to look at the verse and say, well, you know, there are times when I am humbled, and then there's times when I abound. That's not what he's, that's not what he's saying. Now, those aren't, aren't totally separate times, folks, and, 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 uh, I'm asking you to look at the possibility that these things go on simultaneously, that the text seems to indicate that they, they do. The attitude of humility and meekness in, in, in the Word of God is an attitude that's really little understood. You know, uh, we, we tend to, I don't think that my, your average Christian has probably have, would have a little difficult time defining the word meekness. Uh, uh, 
Moses was the meekest of all men. Yet look at how he talked to Pharaoh. You know, and if you or I had been there, we, you know, we might have nudged, you know, Moses, you know, and said, now, you know, be careful, Moses. This is Pharaoh you're talking to, you know. God said he was the meekest of all men. And if we carefully study humility and meekness, I believe the scriptures will reveal that that, that is not primarily your attitude toward other people, but primarily that is your attitude toward God. Uh, Moses, he, what we know is, we do know for a fact is he didn't ascribe any of that glory, any of that power, or any of those commands that he was giving to Pharaoh. He didn't ascribe any of that to himself. He didn't ascribe any power or authority to himself. Uh, he didn't command Pharaoh himself. The command to let his people go was God's command through Moses. Okay, it was not a command by Moses. That's my point. You know, he never said, now look, Pharaoh, I've given you five chances. You either let them go or I'm going to, you know, really zap you with something you know, really, really, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring darkness on the land that a light can't penetrate. He didn't say that. The Lord says, the Lord Jehovah says, Moses never took any glory, any power or authority to himself until he struck the rock twice. Yeah. And, uh, and when he did that, he didn't enter into the land of rest. That's striking the rock, cry, striking the rock, Christ, uh, the the striking the rock twice was without launching into a whole nother. Without, I don't want to make this video any longer than what it's already going to be. But uh, to strike, for Moses to strike the rock twice uh, was uh, a symbolic of Christ being crucified twice. And so when he did that, he couldn't enter into the land of rest. It was Christ, basically Moses saying that his work was insufficient by striking the rock twice. And, and as a result, he couldn't enter into the land of rest. Not, not heaven. It's not that he couldn't enter into heaven. He couldn't enter into rest. Maybe some of you out there will really let, you know, if, if you let that sink in, that, that can be a life-changing moment. But I see it as God's process in our lives constantly to keep us aware Okay, of the fact that it is God, not us. It's a perfect passive. Okay, our primary source of instruction is not the experiences through which we pass, but what God has revealed in this book. I have been instructed, perfect passive. Okay, I have been perfectly instructed in past time with the present result that I remain instructed by God. Okay. And I believe that that's the word of God. Paul is saying, when I'm filled, God did it. When I'm humbled, God did it. And to be hungry, that's a present active. Okay? Now, it, it may be that that means only hung, hunger for food. You can look at it that way. Folks, I don't. I think it means much more than that. I think that Paul was hungry for the fellowship of the Philippians, but they hadn't had any opportunity. I mean, they were also hungry for it, but they hadn't had the opportunity. It wasn't that they wouldn't have done it. It was that they couldn't do it. God had not yet allowed that. And I, and I think the hunger includes infinitely more than just hamburgers, cheeseburgers, and french fries. Or pizza. 
It's fellowship. It's communion. It's it's partnership with other Christians. I think, folks, I think a monastery is far from a biblical principle. Christians by the score have dreamed about buying an island in the South Pacific or something. You know, only Christians there, you know, we know it'd be a it wouldn't take long before it'd be one big mess. I think God has strategically placed his people where they are for reasons which have to do with his plans and purposes. And I believe that we need to fellowship with other Christians. One of the dangers of a ministry like Blessed Hope Forever is, is to become complacent with our own fellowship and, and figure that we're just as, well, we're just, you know, really a step above other Christians and who don't really know very much. You know, we're kind of smart and they're a bunch of idiots. And, you know, it's the only place where you can go to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ is Blessed Hope Forever. And, and what a dumb thing to say. And I believe in that hunger. You know, there's there's the typical Christian desire for fellowship. I drive I drive a, a along when I'm alone in the in the in my Jeep. I'm driving along and you know, turning across the radio, flipping the, the radio dial, uh, looking for something, trying to find something that edifying. That that'd be the word. Looking for Christian radio stations, Christian radio stations, and I put the word in quotes, Christian in quotes there. Most of it's pretty sickening, but every once in a while I hear somebody saying, you know, something that is just plain stupid, biblically. But boy, you can just tell that they love the Lord. And I think, you know, that's my brother and sister in Christ. And, there, and there's suddenly, there's a bond that I recognize there. Yeah, I think all of us have been given a hunger, you know, for Christian fellowship and partner, partnership and the things of Christ. And we, we saw in, the, in, the, in, in this very chapter how that we're to help one another along in the gospel you know, as it pertains to ministry. Um uh, Verse 13, uh, I can do uh, all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That's, that's the authorized version. I am empowered in the one who empowers me. And that's a present active. God is the one who always does the empowering. Okay, I am empowered to do all things in the one who empowers me. The verse only works in... In, in, in our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't work. The verse doesn't work in the old man. Okay. But the new man. God hasn't promised to empower the old man to do anything. Or, or not do anything. I know that I can do all things. I'm, I am empowered to do all things in the one who empowers me. And that isn't saying that I can invest, you know, in that oil well. And it'll be, and, and you know, it'll, it'll be a gusher, you know. You know, I can decide to build a, a Christian school in Afghanistan and it'll, it'll, it'll succeed. It, it doesn't go immediately from the present context of setting my affection on things above and the Word of God to all of the, uh, the things I'd, I'd like to dream about doing where God's going to empower me to do, to, to fulfill all of my, you know, all of my dreams and all of my desires. I believe that, that these all things are those which are contained in the Word of God. I think on, on that which is just, lovely, righteous, honest, uh, honorable, of good report. You know, the things which I, I believe paint a lovely portrait of our Lord and His Word. And I know in whatsoever state I am placed by God, not to look at present cir circumstances, but on those things above. I'm absolutely empowered by God in Christ to do all things in the one who empowers me. Okay? Christ. 
why in him and why empowered? I mean, you know, and we could get into the whole subject of, you know, how much God helps us do righteousness. And, and I'll, I'll just tell you right up front, I don't think he helps us do anything. Except realize that, uh, that uh, we, we are to live a life in utter dependence upon him, which requires that, that I recognize the fact that, I'm only, that it's only when I'm weak that I'm strong. He doesn't help me do righteousness. All righteousness is of the Lord. Okay? The flesh profits nothing. There's no strength. There is no strength to be discovered in the old man. God doesn't empower the old man. My strength is not discovered in, through law keeping. Okay? <clears throat> Especially not when the strength of sin is the law, as Paul also said. You know, this empowerment is directly connected with those things which relate to the person and the work of Christ in our lives, folks. Let me say that again. This empowerment, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and I... You, you can clearly, surely, folks, you can clearly see how where that a legalist can jump on that verse and go, man, I can just do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because he's, he's a, it's his, his whole entire walk is one of the flesh, the old man, keeping the law. I understand that. But that's not what it's talking about. Okay? This empowerment is directly connected with those things which relate to the person and the work of Christ in our lives. Okay? I'm going to let you think about that until next time. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. And until next time, thanks for watching.